It is a pleasure to welcome everyone from around the world to uh, this uh, newest uh, installment of our uh, project called Knowledge Under Siege, New Scholarship in Poland. Uh, this is a series of YIVO programs uh, that presents the new Polish school of research into the Holocaust and antisemitism that is informed by critical theory and cultural critique. Initiated by Jan Tomasz Gross's book, Neighbors in 2000, this new school proposes a new frame of analysis of the Polish share of responsibility for the destruction of Polish Jewry. It revisits the endeavor of Hurban Forschung conducted in Poland by Holocaust survivor scholars, first impeded, then destroyed by Polish bottom up and top down antisemitism. This post war effort reappears as a reference point and an object of critical analysis as well. Research into the material facts and cultural representations, the imagery, the narratives, the ideas of mainstream Polish Holocaust discourse reveals how much the facts were produced by the representations and stem from sources that have been neither deconstructed nor deactivated. A meticulous reconstruction of the historical process, its mechanisms and stakes, causes and effects allows for a more complete grounding of Jewish social and cultural history, providing context to the events and situating them within a socio-cultural continuum between their eve and aftermath also enables a sharper understanding of the present, the legal repression of Holocaust scholars in Poland, the co-optation of existing institutions, the creation of new institutions, the mobilization of distortion and propaganda to fight against the results of historical research and through this effort to deny the Polish realities of the Holocaust. And why is YIVO hosting this series if it has only to do with Poland and Polish scholarship? It has to do with the fact that we at YIVO believe that this effort at Holocaust denial that we see in Poland infects and affects historical truth and the seeking after historical truth throughout the world. We see it in the extreme right-wing movements throughout Europe. We see it in the distortions of liberal democracy in the United States by extremist groups. We see it in the falsifications of history that are well underway in, in Putin's Russia. In short, the denial of the Holocaust is a denial of historical truth. And that is a most dangerous thing in this world today. It is not simply something for textbooks. It is not simply something for schoolrooms. It is not simply something to be discussed in one's home. It needs constant public debate. And so that is what these uh, programs are about. The first took place uh, September 14th. Uh, it was uh, the Dancer and the Holocaust, the history of Pola Nirenska. The second was uh, February 15th, Breaking the Frame, the New School of Polish Jewish Studies. The third was with Anna Bikant, uh, Irena Sendler in hiding. And today is the fourth with Bojana Kef, the Guardians of Fate. Uh, I want to note that this series is being curated by Helena Dotner and by Elzbier Janicka, uh, both uh, in, po in, in Warsaw. And uh, it is also available, previous, uh, previous uh, sessions are now available on YouTube and many of these uh, have now been watched by hundreds of people around the world. Future, uh, future uh, seminars uh, will be Wednesday, May 17th, Night Without End, The Fate of Jews in German Occupied Poland edited by Barbara Engelking and Jan Grabowski. 
And the last uh, will be June 21st uh, with Elspiet Janicka and Tomasz Zhukowski, Philo-Semitic Violence, Polish-Jewish Past in New Polish Narratives. Orzhena Kef, our speaker today, uh, uh, is, uh, uh, has written uh, the book, The Guardians of Fate, excuse me if I don't uh, attempt uh, a Polish pronunciation, uh, which is a collection of essays on Polish language literature about the Holocaust. Kef asks whether those literary works contain a diagnosis of Polish culture that corresponds with its assessment by critical humanities and arts today. In the texts analyzed by Kef, Poles are presented as so-called, quote, Polish witnesses to the Holocaust who were allegedly, quote, helpless because of the Nazi terror. Today, on the basis of the same texts, they are recognized as co-perpetrators. Another topic discussed by Kef are the terms and conditions that Polish culture has imposed upon Jews who undertook to integrate into it. Host and guest regulations were and are intuitively known to all Jews in Poland and are a set of unwritten because obvious, rules of domination and submission. Kef examines their functioning, notably in the biography and work of a Polish language poet of the Holocaust, Tadeusz Rozhevich. Orzhena Kef is a philosopher by training. She is a poet, writer, feminist, activist, theorist. Uh, her books uh, include Figure and Shadow, Portraits of Jewish Women in Polish Literature at the Turn of the Century, Barricades, Obsessive Chronicles, her monograph, uh, Antisemitism, Story Unfinished, was published in 2005. In 2013, uh, I'm sorry, in 2013, and addresses antisemitism as a durable element in European and Polish history and culture. Translated into Hebrew, French, Italian, Spanish, and German, her transgressive poetry suite, uh, on Mother and Fatherland was published in the US in the translation of Alyssa Vallis and Benjamin Palop in 2017. And so, uh, Bojena, it's a great pleasure to welcome you to YIVO. And uh, without further ado, uh, please uh, begin. Well, thank you very much for having me here. And uh, hello to everybody. <clears throat> um, well, yes, I will. I will uh, talk today on my uh, last book, an academic book, on guardians of fate, and uh, my presentation will be devoted mostly to the problem of Jewishness. Uh, in the case of uh, poet and writer Tadeusz Różewicz, very well known in Poland. But I would like uh, to begin with a few words about the context in Polish culture of the problem. The problem is with quotation mark. And forgive me, everybody, if I will do mistakes in English. I will do for sure. It's not my everyday language. So, okay. So my book is titled Guardians of Fate because I thought about those Poles who during the Second World War believed that Jews were doomed and the uh, inescapable destiny of all Jews was to be killed by Nazi. However, they also thought that fate as incarnated in the Germans, only human beings, could not be perfect enough. The Nazis were uh, to complete the Jews' destiny, but they were sometimes unable to find or spot their victims. As they were in a foreign country I did, and didn't have the local knowledge needed to achieve this goal. Uh, uh, hence, if Polish guardians discovered, discovered a Jew hiding in the forest or, or hideouts, or recognize a Jew on a city street pretending to be an Aryan, their task was to make sure that he or she would not remain alive. 
the responsibility of the guardians was uh, thus to make sure that fate would be realized in every possible case. Uh, I analyzed the description of these of those murderous attitudes from the time of the Shoah. They can be found in works published in by Polish authors immediately after war, just in the late 40s and early 50s. The Stalinist period, which is uh, 1948 till 1956, included. But I also use the concept of guardians of faith to analyze attitudes prevalent in Polish culture, which even after the Holocaust have prevented discovery of the roots of Polish antisemitism. In this broader meaning, uh, it can be said that the idea of the guardians of fate describes the continuity of anti-Semitic attitudes in Polish culture. My literary sources have been novels and short stories by authors like, there were a few words about them later, Authors like Zofia Naukowska, Adolf Rudnicki, Kazimierz Brandes, Ludwig Hering, and Kazimierz Frenkel, a writer uh, forgotten now. All of them were never tempted to succumb to easy rationalization of antisemitism in Polish culture. They often described what Jews suffered and endured during the Holocaust and how, how often Poles were co-perpetrators co or just per perpetrators of the crimes against them. Uh, um, yeah. So the authors who wrote about those themes were often leftist, socialist or communist, because at the period, just after the war, the left-wing politics and the seeking of the truth was connected. The authors reflected that part of the history they lived through and judged inhuman, unbearable, and unjust. A new leftist progressive social approach, they hoped, would bring equality and justice. As my book is a collection of essays, a separate essays dedicated to Tadeusz Różewicz, not as an author, but as a case of Jewishness that illustrate this general problem. So, Julia, if you can please show uh, Tadeusz Różewicz with his mother. So poet Tadeusz Różewicz was born in a small city, uh, Radomsko, in 1921. Uh, he was absolutely outstanding Polish poet, screenwriter, playwright, who gained popularity in late 50s and remained popular until the end of his life. He was considered a candidate for the Nobel Prize, and his work has been translated into over 40 languages. He died in 2014. For Polish readers, he is an icon of a Pole who is empathetic toward the victims of the Holocaust. He has been depicted as an outer representative of Polish culture and society. He never undermined or questioned this picture. Nevertheless, his mother was Jewish. She converted to Catholicism and thereafter married a Pole, the father of Ruzevich. During the war, this mean but one thing. The mother and her three sons should die in a gas chamber. Nevertheless, they survived, except of one brother of Tadeusz, who was executed by Nazis as a member of a Polish resistance. So, identity of Tadeusz Różewicz might be Polish, but during the war he was Jewish. Amen. It was Nazi logic and the Nazi rule Poland and Europe. Różewicz with his Polish name and Catholic family, 
was not consi considered a Jew. I'm, I'm talking now about the time of war. No, was not considered a Jew until one day when he was warned by one of so-called Volksdeutsch, um, German loyalist um, uh, Paul from Silesia, that his life was in danger because of the possible denunciation by local Polish women. At that time, he was he was under the protection of a German clerk, but next he joined uh, the Home Army. Um, the Home Army, Army, they were partisans, partisan units representing Polish underground state, subordinated to the Polish government on exile in London. Officially not anti-Semitic, not anti-Semitic, but practice was absolutely different. It was uh, um, up to the people. So Ruzevich joined as Paul, obviously, the home army um, troop. He fought for almost two years. Two years after the war, he never revealed that his true motivation to join the home army uh, was in fact uh, uh, that it was his hideout. Ruzevich wasn't born to kill people, but he was brave and collected in in the battle. And all those facts we know from the his own short story, uh, Wooden Gun, which was published in two thousand and two. <clears throat> Um, and it wasn't said that um, uh, the hero is um, the same person as author. And Ruzevich loved his mother very much. As an old man, he published a book of poems and recollection that he entitled Mother Walks Away. This is in 1999. Except for the pay traces and hints, we can't find anything more explicit about his mother and her, as well as his Jewish family. Today, we know that before the deportation, the Jews from Domsko were herded and imprisoned by Germans in the very church when Ruzevich's mother was praying and in fact hiding as a Catholic Pole. Um, Radomsko Jews, including Kruzevich's mother's family and Jews from the other European places, among them two sisters of Franz Kafka from Prague, were among those who in the same church waited from, for transport on their way to the death. Kafka's sister died in a death camp of uh, Heumno or in German Kulmhof. Um, Ruzevich early poems. Um, early poems means like 1946-7, such as Peak Tale or The Survivor, are in Polish school curriculum. Um, they were, and maybe they are still, often recited, recited by children and used during the school ceremonies. So this is, this is a tr uh, the first lines of the survivor, the survivor. I'm 24, let to slaughter, I survived. The following are empty synonyms, man and beast, love and hate, friend and foe. And so on, so on, so on. This is my interpretation of the of the rest of the poem because it's going like this. The fol following are empty synonyms, and I always felt that the three lines. The these are the first. I'm twenty four. Let to slaughter. I survive. Are true, but also they are deprived of the Jewish context. The following lies are just universal cliche. And uh, the next is Peak Tale, very popular, very popular uh, poem. 
so there is a pigtail when all the women in the transport had their heads shaved four workmen with brooms made of birch twigs swept up and gather up the, the hair behind clean glass in huge chests clouds of dry of dry hair of those suffocate ellipses and the faded plate a pigtail with the ribbon Pull it at schools by naughty boys. And here is, for me, here is the prob a problem. Uh, because a faded plate was absolutely characteristic for Polish peasant girls. Some female heroines from Polish literature for children have pigtails. But Jewish girls pre preferred short hair and bangs. Hair carried a symbolic difference between, between Slavic and Jewish or Jewish and ev everybody, el everybody else. In the Jewish case, it is darker and thicker. The, sim the symbolic meaning is unclear and fuzzy in Ruzevich poems, not like in Paul Celan poem, uh, A Fugue of Death, of death the Todesfuge where we find that the difference cl as clearly symbolic, the ashes of your hair, Shulamit, gold of your hair, Margaret. Margaret, is the, it was a German, German woman. So it, it's not this symbolic uh, content in, in a Ruzevich poem. In many ways, Ruzevich produced a forgery, a falsification of historical facts and meanings. He may even be considered as a, a pioneer of the Polonization of the Holocaust, only of the Holocaust, but I think that he mean it, um, made it universal, but make it universal through the Polonization, it was his way. So, that's the, yes, that's the problem. I think that Ruzevich suffered deeply because of his unclear consciousness and identity and his unacknowledged Jewish background and his fear of talking about it. A certain literary critic said that Ruzevich was unable to cross the horizon of his fear. He must have been afraid that if his mother was found out to be Jewish, he would turn from a poet into a clown and that he would lose everything. Well, he knew Polish culture, witnesses what happened during the war to Jews of Radomsko, and was well aware what horrible events took place elsewhere and by Polish hands. So every time Jewishness was a subject of the discourse, which threatened his secret, his uh, experience made him alert and even aggressive. His identity may have been Polish, but and was, but he was he was far from being its master. Hence, making Poles absent from his poems about the uh, um, Holocaust, Ruzevich certificate their, in, their innocence. He identified Germans, obviously Ukrainians, and even, even mentioned Sweden and Switzerland as countries with bad historical consciousness. Everybody was guilty, but except, except Poland and Poles. Well, such were his tactics, and he considered them useful for them, Sam, for himself, for sorry, for himself, and for the Polish mythology of Polish eternal innocence. But what he did was, in fact, counterproductive in both respects. 1960 year was, uh, I'm sorry, 1968 
was the year when Polish government adopted openly anti-Semitic policies. And Polish society in its majority was openly happy because of that. The very small Jewish minority was persecuted, fired from jobs, academic institution. Jews were leaving Poland by thousand because they were forced to or because they chose to do that. From 1960 on, Ruzevich suffered uh, a kind of acute um, anxiety neurosis. A star of David was pictured on the doors to his flat in those days as a stigma. At this time, he wrote to an acquaintance, some Mr. Majewski, and there is the letter. Perhaps I should tell what ghost haunt me, but possibly I would again swallow everything. I would prevaricate, obfuscate, not telling everything. However, I will be brave. This is what's going on. Often I'm afraid to enter my house, the one I live in. When I see someone standing outside the front door, for example, the giant door with a neighbor, I turn back, walk around for 10, 15 minutes before uh, I master the courage to enter the hall of the house, humiliated and exhausted. It is spring 1940. 68, 1969, 1970. In high school, I was happy, healthy boy. Later on, in the resistance, I um, um, sorry, in a, in the resistance, I was courageous and composed. And now I'm scared to enter my house inhabited by my family, the family I, I love, and whom. I can accept, explain anything. I have amazing clarity of vision. I see and feel myself as I'm afraid to enter the house. I turn back, go away, and finally come back ashamed. And it cost me as much health as a military action during occupation that carried the threat of death and wars of torture. Um, later in his life, Ruzevich became emotionally closer to the Jewish topic, uh, topics in his poetry, but even so, never to his personal history. In 2012, he published in a book of marginal text, Marginalia was the title, uh, the letter to Mr. Majewski quoted above. In the same year, he admitted in an interview that his mother was Jewish, and two years later, he died. So I treated this aspect of his story as neurotic, but not an irrational or unfounded response to the anti-Semitic aspect of Polish culture. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much, Orzena. Thank you. Um, I have uh, a couple of, uh, ah, there we go. There we are. I have a, I have a couple of questions. Uh, your presentation is, almost agonizingly moving, terrible to think of this great poet becoming an accomplice to something he didn't want to be an accomplice to. Would you agree? He yes. didn't have a conscious intention of building a narrative, or did he, in your view? Well, I have to I have to say frankly that I don't know because there is a problem of the times, I mean the 40s and 50s, when this way of the uni universalistic thinking 
was the answer to the Nazis way of thinking yes so excluding and including people but I think that also he knew what he is doing um because it was also this universal uh this universalistic um um no cur curtain uh it was something that he could uh, hide above and uh not to be said that he himself is a jewish he was just the polish i ask my friends sometimes writer is he was he paul yes was he Jew? No. Was he empathetic toward the Jews? Yes. So, um, <laughs> you know, that's 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 the problem because we can't we can't ask him. But there is one thing that is for sure: he uh, he was a very young boy during the thirties in Poland. Yes. And during the 30s in, in Poland, it was a kind of anti-Semitic fever. It was the bench ghetto on the universities. It was a series of uh, pogroms from uh, 36 to, 35 to 37. Um, it was um, the, the problem with the Jewish commerce and the huge discrimination, really the huge discrimination. It goes toward the complete um, um, separation between Poles and Jews. They were never together, but complete separation is also something else. So I think that we have to think about everything at the same time um never to tell that my mother is jewish which means in the logic of uh, nazi time but not only the time jewish uh to be universalist because fascists were not and there is our answer uh but i think that the psychological motives are the a most original and hard one. That's what you do because you have to protect yourself. And because you feel deeply, really, you feel deeply uh, your sorrow, and I don't know even how dra the dramatic sorrow about what happened to the Jews, you have to tell about it. So this is the the composition of uh, of the facts. I see it. I see what. Yeah. 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 So Brzezewicz, who is a Jew, who is a Pole, you consider to be one of those guardians of fate. Yes. Yes. What yes, he was a guardian of fate, of course, because he somehow was uh, agreed that um, to be a Jew is a kind of catastrophe. It means that he somehow internalized the anti-Semitic logic because at the same time, they were, uh, uh, they were um, writers, they write in Polish, sure, but everybody, knew and they also uh said in open way we are jews our identity is jewish identity and identity and they were the stars in a uh, polish literary life um so it wasn't the kind of this catastrophe you can be active in that that way on a literary field it was just Ruzevich absolutely traumatic fear. Yes, by internalization of the um, anti-Semitic way of thinking. And I'm afraid that his mother, uh, his mother was uh, also, she repressed very much 
her uh, Jewish her Jewish origin. She repressed it. It was probably the, the story is not very clean because Ruzevich never told us the story of his mother and uh, um, her Jewish family. Uh, but it was probably something with the um, um, with the father of Stefania. Her name was Stefania. Uh, Ruzevich, who was very orthodox Jew and very harsh to her, and she escaped home from home probably, and went to the priest who was a friend of her when she was very young, baptized her, then uh, um, then look for the husband for her and also save her life. I don't know if it was the same priest, but probably yes, and save her life during the war because she was hiding in in uh, in a church. So, thank you. Um, what what I, I want to ask now, though, is the silence of Ruzhevich is um, mirrored in the silence of many other writers, Polish writers about the Jewish faith. Uh, that's my understanding mm -hmm. of uh, one of the subjects of, of your book, that none uh, really can talk about it in detail. And I wonder if you could then say a few words about what happens in the popular narrative about that fate as a consequence of this silence. In, in a way, this silence is a guardian. Yes, the silence is the guardian, but also I, um, I would like to uh, present next the very popular writers who wrote about um, the Holocaust just after the war and in very open way. Uh, so, and they were very popular writers, but also it was a silence and also it was a mythology uh, forged in the 40s, just during the war or even earlier. Uh, and this, this kind of mythology, I have... Um, uh, I s summarize it um, in in the book, The Guardians of a Fate. Not not in this chapter, not in the chapter of Ruzevich, but in the other chapter. And I I call uh, the consequence of and the summary of this silence uh, set with the tree. Um, I will explain why so uh, such a strange uh, name. The set of the tree is like, how to say it, like a prayer. Uh, what, when you ask, for example, the school children, what was the attitude of Poles toward the Jews during the war? And they will, if they are um, good people, uh, pupils, they will say, well, uh, in Poland, and only in Poland, for helping a Jew, it was the death penalty. But in spite of that, uh, Poles were helping Jews as they could. Um, and uh, evidence of that is that Poles, we, Poles have um, 6,000 of the trees in Yad Vashem. Uh, and it really goes like the like the prayer in Poland and only in Poland, blah, 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 and so on, so on. I heard it in a radio some two years ago because of some American official said something, something so so small that uh, was interpreted by by Polish government as uh, possibly. Possibly not um, in um, in a correlation with this uh, uh, mythology, with this short prayer. So it's really amazing how this prayer, how long life it has. And well, look at at this at this something. 
in Poland and only in Poland. No, not true. Not only in Poland. Uh, there is also, it was on occupied territories of um, the Soviet Union and in Serbia. In other countries, the pen, uh, it wasn't the death penalty, but the punishment could be also in consequences uh, deadly. But in Poland, the death penalty was really for almost everything. If you have a radio, concentration camp, if you are lucky, if you um, slaughter a pig and uh, sell the meat on the black market, death penalty on the spot. Uh, um, of course, if you, can, if you have a gun and if you were in a conspiration, death penalty. And at the same time, in Poland, well, they, um, they, and probably it's too, the home army was the biggest underground army in Europe. So what are we talking about? Is this penalty for helping a Jew is just, you know, it's nothing. It was this penalty really for everything possible. If Germans, if Nazi soldiers were in a, were in a bad, bad mood, uh, to kill somebody with no, with no consequences. So this is not true. Uh, everything is not true, but it was really coined. This formula was coined li like uh, this is the iron curtain. In fact, this is the iron curtain behind which uh, the truth is hiding, and the truth is absolutely, mm, absolutely opposite to this short prayer. Um, to this short play, and but on so the other, were yeah. there were there any Polish writers who told the truth? Yeah, yeah. So maybe you could and talk from the it. from the very be beginning. But the problem with literature is this: you can tell a story of one hero, the second one, the third one, and so on, but you cannot make a generalization, right? So there's one story, another story, the third story, and so on and so on. So if I could ask Yulia for the presentation, I gladly will show uh, to everybody the, from the beginning, if I may ask you, yeah, from uh, uh, yes, and the next page, Breaking the frame is very good. Well, Kazimierz Brandis. So uh, I tried to 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 make a short information. Yes, son of a wealthy Jewish family, uh, they own a bank in Łódź. There is really something. The Łódź was the um, um, the Łódź is was. Um, uh, um, the industrial, uh, the, the the industrial uh, city, and he survived all, on the Aryan side of Warsaw and left Poland uh, in 1981. Just uh, there is, um, yeah. He was really very popular and loved in late 50s and 60s by so-called intelligentsia um, uh, because he was very popular and his book Samson is absolutely unique and very important for me because Samson uh, by Brandis, uh, this book uh, shows the continuity of the Polish anti-Semitism. And that Samson, um, it was the name, the symbolic name for the hero whose name, real name was Jakub Gold. Jakub Gold was Jewish, but also from the family, uh, Polonized family. So he thought about himself that he is Jewish, but Polish or Pole uh, at the same time. And uh, 
before, uh, and the brand is, uh, described his history um, in a pre-war period. He was so much persecuted, victimized, and um, and uh, uh, he, he put into the jail absolutely on uh, on a false false ground and so on so on. Then, when Nazi comes, there is only. Sorry for the word only, but there's only the continuation of what was before war in Poland. Yes, in Poland, independent Poland. So he he was, I mean, the hero. He was victimized, persecuted, humiliated, everything because he was Jewish. And there is a scene that was very, I think, very important for Brandes in the book when Jakub Gold, who was um, um, his friend, uh, Pol Polish friend from jail, a friend from jail, uh, he um, hide, hide Jakub in, in his flat than in his cellar, but he was an older man and had a heart attack. So Jakub left alone, himself very ill, um, feverish, going out from the cellar to the street in a daylight, and uh, he is treated by his. He tried to get to the other to the other address uh, nearby nearby street to the other friend. The public on the street treated him as a as a bear who, who escaped from the circ circus. Uh, they just surround him and they are go after him, following uh, him, not even calling the police, the, I mean the Germans, because it's sure they will uh, find Jakub because there is the daylight and because there is a center of the wall. So, um, so it was an entertainment. It was an entertainment it was a fun uh, we gar guardian guardians of fate that in fact i i thought i thought about the title um, um when i uh, yeah with this uh, with this scene uh, from the brandes book they were guardians of fate in this case, they were unsuccessful, but uh, nevertheless, uh, Jakub Gold died during the, the war. So, uh, and Brandes said, in those days, those days, it means there is more or less during the time of the ghetto uprising, in those after. So if those days, if somebody with the Jewish look appeared on the street of Warsaw, he was doomed. He's, uh, yeah. Um, and um, my, I had, I also noticed that there is some rule. If there are two Poles, two person of the Polish nationality and the Jew, Nobody will help him. If there is one Polish and one Jew, there is a possibility. Because the two Polish person, two Poles, make a society, a nation. So if you don't know the other person, he could denounce you for helping a Jew. But if you are face to face with, uh, with a Jewish person, you can help. Or you can do nothing, which was all also the, the help. So if I can ask Yulia this the next, or maybe I can operate. Oh, Adolf Rudnitsky, very important writer, very good writer, very, very modern. He was a, from Hasidic family, uh, uh, as I innkeepers from very small uh, place, Jabno. And he he de debuted in thirties, uh, mean in uh, um, before war, 
and uh, during the war you can you can see his appearance he was also he lived also on the Aryan uh, play uh, side of Warsaw, so-called Aryan play, uh, side. Uh, blonde, tall, etc., and with good uh, with good documents, with good identity card. Uh, so he often go uh, close to the walls of the ghetto during the uprising and he listen let's finish with a few questions we, we'll go a few minutes over no problem okay and uh jonathan do you want to you want to start off with the question that you had posed um uh, you want me to, you want to circle back to that so yeah you sure yeah so one person um asks an interesting question just um do you think that this these revelations about um Rzevich's Jewish identity or Jewish roots change Jewish. Jewish roots. Does that change how we read his poetry? Um, um, yes, a lot. Um, uh, because he have a lot of poems uh, when he expressed, well, I, I, you know, that is how to say in prose about the poetry, how to tell about this, but well, He's saying about some existential problems and uh, secrets and uh, the heavy burden that he's uh, still having on his back. And there is everything about the Jewish roots. And he's, uh, and he's really bad conscious. And he said in somewhere, he said, if I'm a coward, then I will explain explain and ask for forgiveness only my mother. So, yes, it's it's changed a lot, change a lot. Also, he's um, very good uh, uh, play for theater. The, one of the last one entitled "The Trap," which is somehow about Franz Kafka as uh, the roots of as the sorry the roads of the family of her mother uh, the, and the sister of Franz Kafka they were in the same church and probably I, I'm not sure uh, they everybody go to the same uh, to the same place when they were murdered so and the, this play play about Franz Kafka, I I remember that I saw it and I was like, oh my God, is that about Franz Kafka or this about himself? It was really good. So and I have to uh, I have to say that Ruzevich is not, as we said, it's not my my uh, it's not my poet. It's not my type of a poet. So, uh, in uh, yeah, so that's I think, yes, yes, it's it's changed a lot because it was for him, it was huge problem. Um, about 20 years of the um, therapy only he have <laughs> he have not psychotherapy, <laughs> so he have to, um. Yeah, to deal with the problem by himself with the poems and literature. Another interesting question from a viewer who poses to act as the Jaguar advocate. Um, if he really, the, the viewer asks, if he really didn't want to speak about these topics, um, and he seems to have not wanted to speak about them, how much do we have the right to discover his secrets? It's an interesting question, I guess, in relationship to you know, what is not a value neutral proposition in the first place, you've kind of shown it, you framed it as a very negative thing that he that he had this position. But I wonder if you have any thoughts on the kind of um, ethics around this kind of inquiry. Yeah. Um, how, this is also a hard, hard question. Um, do we have, uh, do we have a right? Yes, because he left a lot of traces. 
everywhere there were traces. There is no such liter literary critic or uh, literary researcher that could uh, make a conclusion out of nothing. It's not possible. You so there are traces in his in his um, works, and there is a lot of traces. Um, probably he has to left those those traces unconsciously, consciously. I don't know. So, um, and I think that yes, the literary researcher there is their duty to um to research and then to tell them what they think about the about the problem and i don't think we we can judge him on on uh on moral terms on the terms of morality because we have probably to do um with a traum traumatic uh, case with a trauma uh, something that he, uh, the fear that he felt so deeply to the core of his uh, whole uh, entity. This is a trauma. So, and also, of course, not only the trauma of the history, there is also the trauma of the culture you are in. And not only you are in, <laughs> I mean, uh, um, in, in, sorry, my English, um, or rather the every words. Not only that you are in the culture, you are the poet in the language of the culture. Um, um, so, and uh, after, and a part of this, the history, he was the witness of the history. And even in uh, his uh, in his troop in a home army, he had a problem, and his officer, in the end, it was happily it was toward the end of the war. Said, "You know what? There are still gossips and gossips, and I'm afraid that I cannot anymore to protect you." But it's crazy, but that how it was. So. For him, I think, like for many others, trauma dies in similar in a similar way. The Jew and to be dead was one thing, the same. The death and to be a Jew. So you have to cope with really a huge problem, a huge problem. Virginia, I maybe this. <clears throat> Uh, un unless Alex, there's another question from. No, oh, please. Yeah. I did want you to comment before we leave off on the question of the extent to which this narrative that you uh, explain that uh, took root in the post war period and even during the war itself. This, this narrative of, of the, the Poles as, as uh, helpful and so on and so forth, the extent to which that has persisted into the present and yes. is a constituent part of official uh, Polish uh, discourse. Yes, yes, official. Mm -hmm. But uh, I was very surprised when during the 50th anniversary of the <clears throat> 1968, a few years ago, when almost every weekly magazine in Poland, not right wing weekly, exposed a lot of knowledge about the truth about the relation between Polish and Jews during the war and after. So that means that uh, the work of historians, of, of, of a humanistic field in every, um, every field, they are effective. Mm -hmm. uh, official narration is not changing, even uh, there is like a stone and that means this is the end of this. Sooner or later, 
it will be the end because you cannot. There is like protecting still and uh, the dead body, just dead body. Um, so I was I was really um, just got it. Um, I was surprised uh, by how by articles, uh, commentaries, columns, and so on during this anniversary. Well, of um, I think where this the field we are uh, we are working on is very small. There is the very for the elite and so on. No. It sometimes as it somehow it goes into the broader uh, circulation and bro broader and broader. So that's why I'm I'm saying. And after all, this is also I'm not very optimistic about uh, Polish. I mean, from the aspect of politics. But from the aspect of uh, changing consciousness, uh, more modern knowledge, yes, yes, I, I, I was an academic teacher. I am still from time to time. So I think, yes. So we should keep doing what we're doing. Yes. So you should keep doing what you're doing. Well, I I have no other uh, possibility. <laughs> <laughs> there is the only thing that pro probably interests me. Only I'm changing languages from the language of uh, literature itself to the language of the researcher of uh, literature. So, yeah. Well, thank you so much for all you have thank done. Thank you very much. Sorry for every mistakes and oh, uh, we... the words I forget. <laughs> and very thank you very much for having me. And very grateful to uh, Helena Dotner and Elspieta Janitska for making this possible. Thank you. Yes, thank, thank you. To, thank you so much. Everybody. Thanks to everybody who attended the meeting. Thank you very, very much. Bye-bye. Bye. Take care.